Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the first in our Ask Us Anything series. And today we are talking about professional services platforms. Um, my name is Matt and I am the new business director from Waypoint. And uh, before we jump into this, I wanted to answer a very simple question. Um, why do we have the right to talk to you about any of this, really? Um, we get asked about our credentials quite a bit. And if you met us at ZeroCon, I'm sure we would have had a conversation about it. Um, we are a Zero Cloud integration partner. We are one of a very, very select few that are classed as preferred by Zero. And essentially what a cloud integrator does is we look at what a business does from an operational perspective and we try to solve problems around those operations by implementing technology and new process and procedure. Now on the two types of work that we do, one being professional services and one being inventory, we are leaders in this field. So that's why we're here. We've been doing this for a number of years and we get asked a lot of questions about what professional services are, what does, what does it all mean, um, and how do we go about doing it. So I wanna break down some terms just very quickly here. Professional services platform, we wanna draw a line in the sand here. Today we're not talking about tools uh, such as like a tax filing or tax lodgement system necessarily. Uh, that's something that would sit in another bucket of work. What we're talking about today is a platform or any platforms that run your daily operations. So telling you what you need to do, who needs to do it, and when they need to do it by. If we were to break that down into some functional areas, we're talking about things like client management, communications, engagement letters, jobs, requests, billing, and it can be something quite simple or it can be quite complex. And so, why are we running a, an Ask Us Anything session? Uh, really because a lot of the time, and you would have found this working with clients or if you've been looking at software platforms yourself, to get solid answers to something quite specific, sometimes you have to go through a fairly lengthy process. You might need to sign up for webinars with software vendors, you might need to go through discovery sessions, um, and you know, sometimes that can take time. And you might just have something that's a bit of a burning question. So what we wanted to do today is we wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to just literally ask us anything. What are the things that uh, have been kind of pressing when it comes to your own software platforms or platforms for your clients? Um, and we're going to do that uh, by taking some of the questions that we've already got from you. And uh, I will moderate this session. So I'll read out the questions and I will uh, hand them over to Dan, who is the experienced one. So uh, let me introduce Dan. Say hi, Dan. Hello. That's Dan. So Dan <laughs> runs Waypoint, um, but he is also the person in charge of all of our most complex jobs. Um, so when we are working with clients that have got multiple apps that need integration or multiple bits and pieces that need to be considered, uh, it's always been Dan and Dan's brain that's been involved in that process. So uh, we're going to start the session now and we're going to go through the submitted questions. So when people signed up to the webinar, there was a field there to ask questions. Um, if you didn't uh, and I'll ask a question and there's something that pops up during the session and you want to ask it, just use the Q&A function. Um, at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we will ask that after we get through the list of submitted questions. All right, so Dan, how are you doing? Good, good, good. Ready to roll? Far away. All right, so uh, we've got a couple of questions here about uh, industries. So the first one is, what are the differences between professional services platforms in different types of industries? Okay, so um, I, I might flip that question in reverse, <laughs> typically, um, and talk a little bit about what's, what's the same about different industries, because um, that's something that people focus on um, 
quite a bit. So professional services is uh, essentially anyone selling, selling people or selling time. So accountants, bookkeepers, um, architects, town planners, people in construction, consultants, anyone where the, the value is based on someone's time. Um, differences between professional services platforms and differences between different industries tend to be quite bespoke to uh, probably more than anything accreditation or something that's accredited. So taking us, for example, like we're consultants, um, we work with accountants, we've worked with agencies, we've worked with other consultants and similar. The 80% of what we do is the same. So we have hourly rates, we have wages and overheads, um, we have projects and budgets. Lots of times the difference is, is the last little piece of output, like we're providing clients a system, accountants might be providing clients reports, compliance or similar, um, and where those things hit something that's accredited. So we've got to submit that to the tax office or we need to go and register a new entity or similar. Um, a lot of project, uh, professional services platforms actually don't consider that last part because I suppose the addressable market is bigger if you say we we can operate in industries that are anything professional services. You've got a lot higher addressable market than just saying we work with five person accounting firms in this town whose name starts with A. Um, that's probably the reason most people go in that direction. So actually the differences between industries are not massive. Um, there's some little bespoke differences, but we tend to find back to the first slide that you first or second slide that you mentioned that that's where we get into things like tax filing lodgement and things that are the kind of 20 percent the actual someone needs to do some work this is what they need to do this is when they need to do it by i don't think there's any real difference based on what you're doing providing the fact that you're selling time and selling people per se yeah so that then leads on to the second question i think you may have answered it uh, which is, you know, we're an accounting firm. Should we be looking for something industry specific or is there a benefit to generalist apps? Um, also good question. So um, I don't know, obviously, all the background about uh, kind of with, uh, people that ask the specific question. But so I would say some, some pros and some cons. Um, generally, what we'll find is um, those things that are specific to accounting practices are generally for that 20%. Um, they're generally for um, the tax filing or you know, the likes of um, uh, super fund setup or um, corporate secretarial like new entities and things like that. Um, in terms of the doing of work, uh, general recommendation and clients we work with, I wouldn't worry about looking at something specific per se, there's still going to be important requirements of what you do. So you still need to know, do we have recurring jobs? How do we bill? What timeline do we bill clients on? How do we quote the client? And so on. Um, you know, there are little, to, like take PI, for example, is amazing at doing client engagements and similar. Uh, again, for the doing of it, wouldn't worry so much about it being specific. Mm. And, and certainly, like if I were to weigh in on that, a lot of the conversations that I have with clients um, tend to, at, at least at the beginning, lean towards something that is industry specific as a preference. Um, and it might be because there is some kind of tool, something, uh, let's take accountants as an example, you know, there might be a tax lodgement tool and you want to try and keep uh, client data moving uh, from the operations platform into the tax lodgement tool. Um, but then there's a whole slew of other tools and none of them really talk to each other very well. Um, you see similar things in building industries. So you have, uh, you know, like really specific estimation and measuring uh, platforms or, or tools out there. Um, and so there tends to be a desire to uh, have a, industry specific professional services platform uh, with the hope, I guess, that it might integrate to one or two of these tools that you might use. But what I've found 
uh, with working client with clients over the years is once we start breaking down just how many tools there are in the business to get things done, um, it's always more than that one or two. And sometimes the process is greater than, oh, sorry, the process requirements and the ability to create some real structural change and benefit there is greater than the number of apps that you want to connect to. Yeah, something, something I've just thought of there as well. Um, one thing I would absolutely make sure people check, either for practices or practices on behalf of their clients, I would definitely check something that you're looking at, um, that they have clients in your industry. Although I don't think it needs to be an industry-specific platform that you use, um, I think it's very much worth checking either the software vendor or partner you're working with or similar, if they've worked, maybe not, again, with specifically a bookkeeping firm of five people in this town, but that they've worked with some similar because there are you know little nuances even in, you might do work the same way, but call things different terms or similar. Yeah. So knowing that if you need support or similar, someone's got some empathy or understanding of your use case is important. I don't think it needs to be the number one task tool for industry X, but knowing there's something there where they've come across it before, that's an important one because there are those little nuances. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, all right, so I think that we've answered that one pretty well. Uh, let's move on. So we've got some questions here. Um, and for context, obviously we received questions in a random order, but we've tried to group them together uh, so that they make a little bit more sense uh, when we're answering them uh, you know, sequentially. So uh, we've got one here about um, looking, just looking at uh, software platforms. So is there a particular size uh, you, I assume your business should be uh, for a professional services system to be implemented? Um, so a fairly broad question. Um, so maybe, you know, employees, revenue, something like that could add some context there. Um, it's a good question. So um, I would say, I would say not so much size, but um, definitely there are a few things that are important in looking at a professional services system. So there's a bundle of people that we speak to that uh paper-based or uh, coming off a spreadsheet or uh, maybe an older school system. Um, I would say we've had clients that are one employee up to 150 employees and they've used similar systems before. What I'd look at more than anything is making sure probably two things. Um, not so much the size of the business, but making sure you've got resource on your side. It might be that you've got an employee or two and aims to put more people on and systemize what you're doing. Providing one of those one or two people has some resource to take on a change and ideally some kind of understanding of the business and similar. Mm. That's probably the more important thing. I wouldn't worry so much. Most systems are user specific or come in user blocks. So in other words, if you're using five users, you pay a different price to if you're using 20 or 100 or similar. So you shouldn't find a need to suddenly have, you know, you've got five employees, you're going to be paying five grand a month for the system. Um, definitely, though, uh, you know, kind of goes without saying what we do, but you get in what you're sorry, you, you get out what you put in. Um, so I definitely make sure where I've seen people struggle in the past is not so much that they are small and therefore don't get benefit, but they're small, everyone's wearing a thousand hats, no one can take on learning something new um, and similar. That's probably the biggest um, flag, I would say, is more resource-based than the, the business. Business-wise, you know, um, may well be if you're at the, the smaller end of revenue, you may not have as much opportunity to like use a professional or similar. You may then have to put more resource into this. Um, but otherwise, you know, most of the systems that we work with that we see clients using up, you know, anywhere from 10 to a hundred dollars a user a month, that's not difficult. You know, that's at a maximum, probably half of someone's hourly rate for one hour. So yeah. 
I don't I don't think there's a minimum per se, but definitely the initial project side, I'd watch for that. That's that's yeah. really important. Yeah, and then certainly I, I would I would back that up. Uh, the way I've uh, seen, I guess, from the outside looking in, um, for context, so I work with clients at the start of a process, um, and then I hand over to someone far more knowledgeable on systems, uh, like Dan, and uh, they work through the client uh, on all of the detailed requirements and system processes and things like that. Well. Um, when we move into the project, I tend to, you know, just get a bit of a bird's eye view of what's been going on uh, since I handed over uh, the client. And I can tell you, hands down, that the best projects that we run always have someone internally that is a dedicated resource. Um, it also helps frame the requirements because, you know, if we walk into a if we walk into a business and just start asking questions about how you do things, and we've got ten people in the room. Um, but no one is the designated kind of project leader um, and you haven't kind of gone through a little bit of an internal audit yourself. Oftentimes I've, I've seen uh, you get some bickering, you get people that use different terminology to other people and, you know, you get caught up in semantics and we lose a lot of time uh, working through that with clients. So um, if you've got someone internally that kind of takes it on, gets given the resource and uh, the... Uh, ability to make some decisions about process it usually is reflective of an internal audit have has already gone on uh, and it tends to then be that you've already had the arguments you've had the discussions and you've really distilled what you need down to the appropriate uh, elements of a requirement set and you've also typically uh, decided on terminology and you've worked out all the semantic confusion um, by doing that and so by the time then you get to work with someone like us um, it's a lot clearer everyone tends to be on the same page and uh, tends to be that the person in charge of the project from your end um, yeah can work a lot more effectively because they can just make decisions because they know what they know what uh, they need to sign off on um, I think between the two of us, we've also answered another question. So it was just about uh, the amount of resource uh, that we need to set up a professional services system. But uh, maybe we could talk a little bit more uh, about the actual projects themselves. So we've talked a bit about uh, scoping it out and you know having a project leader, but you know, maybe we can talk about the time actually doing setups. Yeah, so I, I suppose that is something that varies definitely by by size of company so you know a two person organization is going to take longer sorry it's going to take less time or less resource to implement than a 100 person organization um things that i'd look for there flags that i'd raise things that i'd point out um certainly in terms of um finding someone to take it on internally so matt like you said like that's super important and projects go better with a point person than with kind of um, crowd decisions. Um, a few points there where I've seen things go right and go wrong. Um, doesn't need to be like managing director, CEO, but it needs to be someone with some level of, of management or some level of authority. It needs to be someone that can actually make a decision. Um, it's not to say they're the, the kind of holder of all truth, but they at least need to be able to say, this department saying this, this department saying this, our direction is going to be that. They need yeah. to be able to, to cut through that. Um, so going back to how you find a resource, seeing clients in the past say, well, Bob the junior is the freest, so we'll give them this to run on, um, but they don't have any authority to make those final decisions. They end up bottlenecked by the resource or lack of resource at like a partner level or director level. Um, the other side, when you get a little bit later into the setup and the work, um, whether outsourcing or doing it yourself is having someone with some level of tech ability. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be like most tools that people are using now with, um, with zero, with QBO, with other similar tools that relate to them are fairly intuitive. You're not having to set up a server or do anything else, but still, having and knowing basics of helping people check their access, seeing if other users are 
having the same issues, getting the same results will, will also help with resources as well. Um, and probably to the most important point, help with change management internally. That's probably where between a two person organization and a hundred person organization, the couple of big things where um, they will take more time. One is training, unless you fancy getting a hundred people in one room and trying to train them, which doesn't work. Um, the other is change management that with a hundred people, you've got a hundred heads butting against each other, a hundred people with their little 1% way of doing things and similar. Um, arguably, especially if someone knows what they're doing, whether you've got two users to set up in a system or a hundred minimal time difference, if you've got two jobs to set up or a hundred actually minimal time difference in the grand scheme of things, it's getting people through the change, getting people trained, making sure everything works in the system and what will blow that resource and what will use twice as much time as you expect is not having the right person running it. Okay, and so that, that actually raises a question then about seeking assistance. Um, when I've worked with some clients that have uh, maybe not got the right resources to run a project internally or they've taken something on themselves uh, and uh, maybe have been through a few attempts at it and then turned around and said, you know what, maybe we need some help with this. Maybe we need someone like, like a waypoint or, you know, an external consultant to come in. Um, I've seen that a few times, quite a few times over the years. I'm sure you have as well. Uh, so I guess a question that we've got here that we can answer then is at what point should someone start looking for that external assistance? Is there, are there any kind of uh, immediate flags or wild cards or anything in that, that they should look out for that would say, uh, yeah, we, we probably need a consultant. Um, probably the, the biggest one is going to be resource. Um, what, what I see, what I see a lot of businesses get wrong and, and Look, obviously, I'm, I'm on the side of getting professionals to do things by the nature of what we do, but I'll talk kind of pros and cons. Um, resource is the biggest one. The most common thing is one way or another, a client saying, hey, we want to set up a system for our practice, but don't have the time. Whether, whether that is specifically, we don't have the time to set it up, or we don't think we have the knowledge or the time to learn that knowledge. Um, that's probably the biggest driver of people probably putting their hand up and saying, I think I need some help with this. Um, other things will be, um, as well as resource, could be ability. So we have probably a proportion of clients that I speak to that will say, we don't know systems, we don't know tech, we just need help for things. That in itself is a little bit of a flag back to the point I mentioned earlier about um, Ideally, having someone who's a little bit techy that can at least take things on internally mm. for all the will in the world. If you get someone external to do this, you're not employing them. So definitely a flag I would raise is someone internally still needs to take on the training and similar. Um, something else I would say that probably not enough businesses do is to work out um, both the cost, but probably more the opportunity cost of um, projects like this. So taking simple maths examples without getting too techy, especially with accountants in the room, um, X hourly rate that you charge, obviously, if something is going to take 50 or 100 hours of time or 10 days or 20 days or whatever, um, that's cost out of the business, obviously, to ex externalize it to someone else. Um, you need to make sure that that's freeing up time internally for you to keep billing and keeping cash flow coming in and running and similar. Um, goes back to the same resourcing issue that we need to be very, very aware of. Um, I would say though, um, those that um, those that work well sending something out, a project out like this externally, um, have some kind of processes in place. That's probably something that you can't completely externalize is just to say to someone, great, I just want that system, just make it happen for me. Um, goes back to change management again. Um, 
so have processes in place, have have assigned a budget, whether it's cost or time. Um, either way, you need to budget something. You can't just magically kind of turn the lights off one day, come back in the next day, and the system's done. It's either going to be your time or your cost. It's going to be one or the other. Um, those are probably the two biggest drivers. And I would say probably, I'll throw this question without notice back to you, Matt, because you'll probably hear this before I do, but that time cost balance, like you've got to pay with one of them, one way or another. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm assuming you probably hear it more than me because by the time they get to me, they're paying cost, frankly. But that's that's a trade-off people have got to think about. You've got to pay one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's something that I'd say probably in about 50% of the conversations I have, have I, I need to bring up. Um, I think uh, not so much in the professional services industry, actual industries, actually. I think just by the nature of being uh, businesses that charge for time, the understanding of time is is a hell of a lot more um, in depth, I guess. Uh, in other industries, it tends to, it tends to be something that uh, comes up quite a bit. Where I guess it just hasn't been considered. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really come up all that much. You know, we might have subtle conversations about it. We might talk about uh, you know taking on a new platform and just kind of the hours that are required really for things to become ingrained. Um, and certainly projects, um, slight, slight skew off topic a, a little bit potentially, but when you implement a new system, I'm always telling people that what gets implemented and what you go live with isn't going to be what you're using uh, inside of that same platform probably in 12 months. Certainly if you've got a, a system that's highly configurable, uh, say something like an Excello or something like that, um, part of the process is not just learning how to use the platform, which, you know, we do all the training and stuff on, but it's getting your hands dirty and then understanding the, the system logic over time. It's, it's like switching from, you know, iPhone to Android or the other way around, you know, each system has its own way of doing things. You've got to understand those fundamentals and really it's by getting your hands dirty in the system that it lets you do that. And that just takes time. It's not something that will ever happen overnight. Um, and certainly, you know, when you move into a new, a new platform like this, it's not just the time up front, it's the time after go live that needs to be considered too. I think you, you've got hundreds and hundreds of hours there before I think that you really can have a, an in-depth understanding of what a system does. Um, if you're time poor as it is and you're going to try to implement it yourself you've got to try and front load that and uh, get as much learning done ahead of implementation otherwise you'll probably find um, and certainly in the accounting industry we've seen this a bit with uh, practice management platforms where people have gone through multiple attempts at uh, implementing their own practice management but they don't have the time to spend at the front to really really get under the hood um, so that that can that's a that's a trade off that you just need to factor in. Two two kind of points there um, that I've just thought of with, with what you're mentioning. One one is muscle memory, um, and the other is as you were saying, time post implementation. Two things that quite often come up, especially when we get into the end of clients reviewing the system that we've given them and, and going live. One is realism that probably the first job you ever put in this system is going to be the slowest one you ever do the first invoice you ever raise is going to be the slowest one you ever do yeah. um especially in a bigger organization it, it's another thing of change management like everybody needs to be clear on this like you said iphone android they both make phone calls but the first time you try and share a photo or sync something you'll hit all the things um same with muscle memory, like the um, back to probably talking about resource and flags, something that we tend to ask people, which is really important is how long you've had a current system and how long certain employees have been using that system. So we've had people who have used a particular system for 10, 15, 20 years um, and might have the most fundamental flaws in the workflow, but use it for five or 10 years and you forget that, you know, the wheel rattles when you turn slightly left. And if you put it in third gear, it makes a noise and everything else. Um, muscle memory is 
so powerful that people just forget the irritations that there's that many clicks there and this happens there. And it can completely knock people off when they're in a new system if they don't know why and how and similar. So um, certainly in terms of a couple of points you're making there about the system not being as it is on day one and, and improving as you go, they're two other big things yeah. for um, doing things yourself and two other big flags. Um, all right, we're about halfway, so I'm just going to take the moment to remind the participants in the room that uh, if you have questions that have come up uh, based on what Dan and I have discussed, please do throw them into the Q&A box down below and we will answer them shortly. Um, the next question I've got here, I think it's actually about an, a platform specifically. So uh, what do you know about expert systems? Um, in title case. Now that rings a bell. I think it is actually a platform. Are you familiar with it? Um, there was, so I saw this question when it came in um, for the sake of uh, other participants, there was a little video with the, the system, but essentially the concept here was um, uh, an attempt that someone had made basically to kind of self design a, what I believe they're calling it, an expert system. So in other words saying, look like a, a, a CA or a CPA, accounting practice, but essentially getting a simple workflow tool. So mm -hmm. the kind of checklist almost like do this, do this, do this, do this. So new tax, um, new, t uh, new individual tax return comes in. We need to check top line figures, tick. We need to confirm super funds, tick, and so on and so forth. Um, I think looking at the video, it had been done in like, even Microsoft Access or some database or similar. Um, I, want, I wanted to answer it for two reasons. One, so that the person that submitted it got the answer, but also it brings up a really interesting point that um, this was something that it looked like the practice had just built themselves just to have less paper in the office. So rather than having tick boxes on um, uh, like a almost like a check sheet that lots of accounting practices do, like a new client checklist or a form or similar. Um, they built little processes to have this digitized and so they can record, did we do all the things we need to do? Um, I'd suspect it was probably costing them nothing once it was set up. Um, personally, I love that approach, especially as a starter from paper, because it teaches you a ton of things about process and logic. So paper and spreadsheets and documents and things like that are ubiquitous and they're kind of the best of things and the worst of things. So they're the best of things in that you have a checklist document, you can just fill it out. No one needs teaching how to use a word document or similar. They're kind of the worst of things because you have no set process, you have no um, rules or anything else. So this time if we don't need to do that thing or I want to change this piece of text, whatever, you just delete it, get rid of it, and every process falls slightly different. Um, similar to what we were talking about with resource, um, where clients have set up systems well or have worked well or similar is that they have the process or processes already there or at least documented or drafted and the system um, wraps around them. So two different things, system and process. Um, in that kind of case, I think going, um, going through and getting something together, whether it's, whether it is a spreadsheet, whether it's a little database, whatever, having something like that puts you, I would say on a better footing to then say, cool, I'm going to get a system that will make this easier by firing notifications and having dependencies and telling me if things fall overdue and similar. Um, having no set processes or similar and saying, cool, this amazing system, there's all the analogies in the world that people use of like, cool, someone could give you a Formula One car, it doesn't mean you're gonna be able to drive it at 300 miles an hour. Um, I definitely, uh, I, I like the approach of having base system first and getting processes at least set um, versus going from nothing per se and trying to just throw everything straight into a system and just imagining it's going to basically run your business for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd add to that. Um, in some of the conversations I've had in the past that uh, oftentimes 
when a business has gone through new ownership, new change of uh, management or something like that, there can be a scenario where someone quite tech savvy comes into the business. And particularly if the business is running on pen, paper, spreadsheets, um, you know, fairly ubiquitous, but rudimentary tools, um, unless the whole staff change over at the same time, going from zero to a hundred in some, like big whiz bang system can be quite difficult. Um, the change management has to extend beyond uh, the management of the business. The people using the tools and whatnot need to have some of this stuff ironed out. And certainly if they're, if they're not uh, using anything that is complex by nature, if they're, if they're used to just simple checklists and things like that, even if it is, uh, even if it is just in a custom made database application already, that tends to put them definitely, as you said, on a better footing to move forward into something that is more complicated. Um, you know, there's already there's a couple of, of button press system logic, things like that. There's a couple of, um, it's slightly out of left field. There's a couple of like startup type, um, analogies and pieces of logic that you can kind of use here. And it, it tends to be alien to a lot of professional services businesses and without prejudice, especially accredited ones like accounting law, things like that. Um, one which we've had a couple of clients do previously is a kind of fail fast approach. So if mistakes are going to happen, if a system's not going to work, if, if whatever, know that quickly. So that's where almost having like, something like you said, you know, spreadsheet or tick box or similar that at least can say, cool, the process works that someone comes in the door, we get their information, we file individual tax return, we send them the work papers and so on. Um, you know that without having a $1,000 a month system, without spending an absolute fortune, without going through that part. Um, yeah. Conversely, uh, we've seen in the past where people will blur the lines and not always know when then when looking at a new system, if you're changing the system and the process at the same time, does the system fail at this point or does the process fail at this point? Yeah. You, you have no way of knowing that if you're changing everything at the same time, you've got no way of finding where that point's coming from. They're two really, really useful things. A couple of clients um, have uh, actually done some interesting things previously where they'll almost take where we talk about change in process, because every system handles things slightly differently. Go back to car analogy before, like mute button for the radio will be in a different place. This will be in a different mm. place. Um, they'll change some of that in the current system. So they'll do that first to kind of get people used to how it will have to be done um, to help avoid having to do everything at once, if that makes sense. That's yeah. There's two, two or three things you can do there's a ton of stuff that you can do. Two or three good little tips to reduce risk as much as possible um, within the kind of processes. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So we've got a couple of questions here uh, that look specific to the accounting industry. Uh, so uh, someone has asked here, what work tools should be integrated to our platform? Uh, what's reasonable to expect? My clients can run their whole business from one or two apps, but our practice tends to have about 10 or 12. Mm, okay. So I'm going to work on an assumption here that because they've said practice and I think you said account there, but I, I'm going to assume yeah. it's kind of accountant. I, I'm assuming practice. accountant, yeah. Um, so the first thing is 10 or 12 per se is not a problem in and of itself. If you if you start to think about real surface type tools, like you know, you've got to use something for your email, something for your calendar, like we're using Zoom today, um, things like that. They're more kind of incidental, but definitely, was he uh, centralizing, as you said, second or third slide, Matt, the day-to-day -day operations, really important. So workflows, tasks, and logic like that. Um, Definite flag I'll give and point that I'll make is that um, accounting, I kind of alluded to it earlier when I was talking about um, accredited industries or certified industries. Accounting and bookkeeping hit tends to hit a problem of needing more um, 
more than the average user in terms of applications because of things like the ATO, um, client documentation, client communication as well. Mm -hmm. So whereas, um, so we've got another webinar tomorrow for inventory. If you're selling widgets, I'm selling a widget, you want to buy a widget, I need to ship it to you and send you an invoice. Um, especially when we then talk about accounting practices, I may then need to set up an entity for you or submit something to the ATO or make payments on behalf. And unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, you can only go as fast as the slowest carriage on the train. And hopefully there's no representatives on the call, but the ATO here or any government organization is the slowest carriage on the train. Mm. So we tend to find that there's a lot of platform, more task oriented workflow platforms that can't integrate to get information out of the ATO. They're very restrictive on what you can send and receive for you know security reasons. Um, so we tend to find that means there are more applications because you'll yeah. there'll be something for you know even at the moment I know there's individual information can come through MyGov can come electronic uh, electronically through Post through um, the ATO portal yada yada yada. Um, so per se I wouldn't worry about having more than some of your clients may, but I certainly make sure at least in the in the core of what you do, which is tracking your time, billing for your time, sending clients, quote, getting approval, getting paid, I'd make sure at least that is as centralized as possible. Then the getting a super fund, submitting tax, doing that stuff, that's kind of by the by. Yeah. Um, but that's definitely one. I know the ATO's got digital... Um, Crap, I forget the name every time. Digital providers, I think they're called that they're yeah. certifying now. So probably more applications like you know, Zero can submit more things to the ATO. I'm hopeful there'll be more things like to get client communication and documentation. There's more in the UK and the US. Um, hopefully it comes soon. Um, central workflow, I'd make sure is is as singular as possible. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um We've got a question. Now, this one is definitely for the accounting industry. Uh, <laughs> it's quite funny. Uh, our partners are focused on profitability reporting, but our time tracking tools are redacted. <laughs> Let's just say old and, <laughs> old and clunky. Uh, how do we address this? Uh, that's that's a people. That's a bit of a people issue. Uh, yeah, there's probably respect. two. There's probably two parts there. So. Um, Time tracking tools being crap um, is not unheard of in a lot of places. I, I, I put this somewhere, so back to the point earlier about um, uh, where I talked about if you change a process and change a system at the same time, be careful which one is, is working or not working. Um, I kind of say similar here. So I've heard lots of times from people who will say, um, the time tracking we use is really antiquated. So, you know, you have there's lots of clicks or it's not easy to find a job or whatever it might be. Um, and they look at some new options and demo them or similar and uh, love the look of, hey, I can start and stop a timer. I can um, automatically track based on, you know, location. Um, I can have calendar events, all, all the things that make them easier. And I would argue 80% of the time they don't see the improvement they perceive because people hate doing the timesheets, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, we could spend a whole other hour, I'm not going to get into here the kind of merits of value pricing and time tracking and, and so on and so forth. But um, I definitely would look for tools that can make it as easy as possible for people. There's going to be things that people never like doing in business. People never really like chasing debt, um, doing cold sales, doing timesheets, those kinds of things. Um, they're always going to be an irritation, frankly. Um, there are things that you can look at to make it easier. Um, it's always difficult here as well because there's a bit of a, by the sound of the question anyway, um, there's a bit of a mismatch. So uh, I haven't got the question back in front of me, but it sounded like kind of, 
the people doing the time tracking don't like the tool, it's antiquated, etc. The mm. partners want reporting, and these are two people at, or two areas of people at quite different levels. And that's mm. that's something that we get um, more broadly as well, is partners, managers, C-level people want one thing, usually more broad, more overview. People, especially those time tracking and that have KPIs and bonuses and things, just want to do their work as quickly and easily as possible. Mm. Um, uh, it's another point why the key person and who you pick as that key person is important and needs to have some kind of mandate because they can be a good conduit between those. Like this is why it matters, not because we're watching what you track and how you do it and everything else, but we need to know when we're giving you 10 minutes to do that job, you can't do it in that time. It's not feasible yeah. or similar. Yeah. Um, I would argue somewhat controversially that none of that question is a system thing. More, I, I'm glad it got asked because it's a really important one, but I think I've barely ever seen a time sheeting problem fixed by a different system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I can give two, two examples, one of them in the accounting industry. Um, so a similar scenario, actually. Uh, but I guess the, the problem in this case came down to it wasn't that the partners aren't actually the ones that need to do any of the timesheet entries. The partners, um, the senior partners anyway, that uh, everything needed to go through still use just pen, paper, notes, and basically they're throwing, they're still working with clients, but you know, they're the kind of living, living that uh, managing director life or that senior partner life, you know, and they're uh, doing their work. They're just taking very brief notes on a pen and paper and then they're throwing it at someone junior in the business and they clean it up. They do all the timesheet entries. They do everything for them. So, uh, for those partners, it's all about just seeing how profitable the business is because they're getting paid anyway. Um, so one of the one of the questions I guess I ask in that scenario is like, well, okay, do the partners actually take the responsibility for their own time entries? Um, what I've tended to find is in any business where the senior people are doing the same things on a daily basis as the junior people, um, if a problem is there, it'll get addressed. Um, and in another industry, so in digital, uh, like digital agencies and stuff like that, uh, we, I can think of an example where uh, we actually didn't win the job. We lost, we lost the opportunity uh, and it came down to financial reporting. So the, uh, the requirements for actually getting the right data into the system to then be reported on later and develop profitability uh, reporting and things like that actually had, would dictate quite a complex workflow. The tool to implement that complex workflow and, man and mandate it across the board and uh, basically enforce staff to use it so that then you're getting good data in to then spit out later uh, was one tool and it's built in reporting uh, didn't quite have the the right reports for management, it would have required a BI tool. Now, the advantage of something like that is then you're not locked into what the system offers. You build the, the reporting tool to exactly do what you want it to do. So you get greater flexibility. And we weren't talking like a lot of money on this. Uh, the competing platform uh, had the reports that they wanted from a financial perspective ready to go. They were in the system. Uh, but the actual tool for put, getting the data in there and uh, dictating the workflows was not complex in the slightest. It was it was kind of like here's a here's a bucket that's a project. Here's a couple of tasks. Go. Um, there was nothing really complex beyond that. So you had two very uh, oppositional sides inside of the business. You had the people doing the doing that wanted the tool that helped them do the doing, and then you had the people that didn't have to do any of that. And uh, unfortunately, it was uh, the managers and uh, head of accounting that uh, won out in, the, in that case. And yeah, so we didn't get the job. Um, all right. So there's not really an answer to that. It's just uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, now, uh, let's see. We have here uh, next question. So what... Uh, and, and I think this question, uh, whoever submitted it has submitted it for both sessions. So thank you for submitting it because it is a good, a good question. So we've got, uh, as Dan said, we've got a session on 
inventory and supply chain tomorrow. So they're asking, uh, what tips and tricks uh, do you have to get information from software vendors? Uh, examples are like feature request pages, uh, demos, YouTube videos, that kind of stuff. Uh, like wh where's a good place to start to get all this stuff together? Uh, cool. Okay. Um, so there's, this is always an interesting one and it, and it kind of goes back to um, various points that we've made about knowing your process, um, knowing um, how you handle certain things, um, making sure those first, so various things. One, um, almost every vendor will do a demo uh, at any point. Um, so most, uh, most vendors will uh, do a demo. Some will have static demos on the website. So here's a 20 minute video of walking around the system. Um, almost all of them will do demos for you. A couple of things I'd recommend or potentially look out for there. One is I would expect you to be asked some questions before there's a demo. At a, at a worst case, at least your industry, your size. Um, and some vendors will ask like a key pain point or something along those lines. Um, if it's generic to the point of here's a screen for a job, here's the screen for an invoice, I don't really see the benefit. Um, kind of goes back to that point as well earlier about finding out if they've got um, clients in your industry and similar. Um, I would definitely look at um, like peer reviews. I would be careful of um, peer groups. They can be incredibly useful. Um, we've got some really good stuff from them before, like Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups and similar. I'd be careful of the throwaway questions along the lines of, um, this is more if you're looking for clients, but like, I need a point of sale for my client. And everyone has a client that's used one somewhere in different industries, different sizes, different logic. Um, something, if you've got processes fairly tight um, uh, or a pretty good idea of what you're looking for, a um, couple of really good tricks are to check. So um, most uh, vendors will have help files, um, which you can access online. You sometimes have to Google them. They're not on the homepage. Um, some of them will also have their feature requests. This is mainly like... SaaS web providers. Um, some of them will hide them, kind of understandably, because if they're getting feature requests, they kind of want them from people that are actually using the system that they can tell what industry they're in, how they're using the system, rather than just people throwing in that are never going to pay, frankly. Yeah. Um, but you can nearly always ask, and I would ask people like, what's the top three to five requested features? Because there'll be things that, you know, no website's gonna tell you the stuff the system doesn't do. Um, I, and same like with us, if people ask us that about a system, it, it's generally on the first call, we'll, we'll kind of tick them off to make sure we're not going down a path the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, I also watch out if anything is behind a paywall, so if, vendors don't have payment information on their website, it usually means it's either expensive or price on application and tends to be kind of maybe not made up, but um, subjective. There's no reason a vendor shouldn't be able to have a per user price, maybe with um, some changes if you need little extra modules or similar. Um, I definitely look at that. It goes back to an earlier point as well. Um, price per head is always worth um, looking for, not so much for what it is, but for making sure, especially in professional services businesses, um, making sure there is a price per head rather than you pay a flat fee. And then if you have less staff or similarly, you're gonna have a problem. Um, and finally on that, um, I would say um, making sure as well um, with that price per head, check, a lot of people don't do this. Check what a user or a user or a seat is classed as. Sometimes if you've got part-time staff or people that just need like view access only or similar, there can be options to get reduced rates or similar. Um, 
there's probably some more I can think of. Um, yeah, it was a good yeah, segue that's... anyway. So that that was that was actually our first of the live questions. I was looking at the live Q and A, and it was it was about uh, how do you price or what should we be paying per head for a piece of software? Um, yeah, so good good segue. Yeah, uh, and I suppose on that very super quick answer to that one because it was asked, um, and I'm aware we're at two minutes to eleven. Um, in terms of what should you pay, it's going to depend on what the system is doing. So I wouldn't expect to pay $10 for a system that will run all your workflows. I wouldn't expect to pay $100 for a system that just generates an invoice. Um, I definitely look at it compared to price per head and I'd look at it compared to billing and billable rate. Like I said, you know, 100 bucks yeah. is not cheap per head, but if you know your um, if your general kind of accountants are charged out 150 to 250 bucks, then yeah, half an hour a month and pay for itself. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that typically we see uh, quite a bit when we're doing uh, when we're doing pricing for potential jobs. I mean, yeah, if you're if you're charging out over a hundred dollars for an hour, I mean, then really all we need to do is find you uh, in a new system something like half of that typically or you know or, or maybe close to that on a monthly basis for the software platform to pay for itself um, and by that i mean increased efficiencies um, a lot of the times when we do projects you can safely say you'll find that you know on a daily basis and if not if not just one hour of save time you probably find multiple if you've got the systems and processes in place correctly um, so yeah, it, it's, there's not really a solid answer. There's not a dollar figure answer. It, it's a bit of a sliding scale. Um, am conscious of time. We've got just one live question left. So we answered that one. This one is actually a bit of a complex one. So we might have to, Dan, uh, give a bit of a brief answer on this one. Sorry, sorry to pop a hint there at you. Um, we have trouble tracking client requests. How do we get that into our contract billing? Oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, a one hour question for 30 seconds. Um, yeah, I'd uh, say something like that. I mean, given the time, it's look, Accelo as a platform does that quite beautifully. Um, but I think it's probably something that we should uh, speak about offline. So maybe drop us an email. Yeah, I'd, I'd say similar. First, first flag I'd have there is, is what you're billing for and how, but there's a whole range of deeper conversation there about price points and monthly billing and time and materials billing and similar. Um, if there is anything else off the webinar or similar, obviously there's, there's emails and things as well, but yeah, that's probably in 30 seconds. That's probably as far as I can go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so on that point, then I just like to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, if you have follow up questions uh, or if you want to get in touch, obviously just go to our website here. The web address on screen is wearewaypoint.com and you'll find a nice little chat bot uh, in there that can let you book a call with us. Uh, and uh, stay around tomorrow, same time. Uh, we'll be running another one of these sessions on uh, inventory and supply chain solutions, the same format. Uh, and this recording will be available shortly via our YouTube channel. So if you came in late, uh, you'll be able to come back in and uh, hear all of the questions that were asked and answered earlier on. Thanks for popping by and we will see you next time.